cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your Peptide Buddy. Hey everybody, so there's a sect of human health research, kind of its own little niche, dedicated entirely to the meds that are most famously associated with erectile dysfunction, and in some cases premature ejaculation. I'm talking about the Viagras and the Cialises of the world. But what a lot of people don't realize is that these aren't just sex pills. They belong to a broader pharmacological class called PDE5 inhibitors, and their reach goes way beyond the bedroom. So let's talk about them. We'll break down what PDE5 inhibitors actually are, how they work at a physiologic level, what conditions they were originally designed to treat, and why they became so synonymous with sexual performance. Then we'll get into more experimental stuff, supposed benefits for athletic performance, endurance, and even some of the newer claims surrounding fat loss, longevity, and mitochondrial support. Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, PDE5s, work by inhibiting an enzyme unsurprisingly named phosphodiesterase type 5. What this inhibition does is prevent the breakdown of CGMP inside smooth muscle cells. That's important because CGMP enhances the activity of nitric oxide, leading to vasodilation and smooth muscle relaxation. That's the core mechanism responsible for many of its proposed effects. Now, here's the funny part. The erectile promoting effects, those were kind of an accidental, inadvertent discovery. Just like the melanotan peptides, PDE5 inhibitors weren't originally being developed to give you a stronger erection. They were meant for cardiovascular conditions. Specifically, they were explored as potential treatments for hypertension and angina, with the idea that relaxing the vasculature surrounding the heart would improve chest pain and blood flow, but the trials rolled out and patients started reporting feeling a very different kind of improvement, and well, the rest is pharmaceutical history. And now some of these medications are first-line treatment for erectile dysfunction, popularly so, and also as a treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, which is basically when the right side of the heart has to pump against higher pressures in the blood vessels leading to the lungs before that blood makes its way back to the left side of the heart. The idea here is that by relaxing those vessels, PDE5 inhibitors can ease that pressure load and improve overall circulation through the lungs and beyond. There's also a body of research supporting its use for high altitude illness, which leads to increased pulmonary pressure for penile rehabilitation after genitourinary surgeries and even for urinary tract symptoms tied to benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, non-cancerous age-related prostate enlargement. BPH can cause hesitancy, nocturia, where you wake up during the middle of the night to urinate, and that frustrating inability to fully empty the bladder, leaving patients with a weak or intermittent stream and a lingering, unsatisfying urge to go to the bathroom again. It's even been associated with worsening erectile dysfunction. As is obvious to anyone keeping an eye on the biohacking and human optimization spaces, the reach of these medications is stretching well beyond the bedroom. Sildenafil, which is marketed as Viagra, has a half-life of about four hours and is approved for use in erectile dysfunction and pulmonary arterial hypertension. Taldalafil or Cialis has a much longer half-life, up to 17.5 hours, and is used for some of these conditions as well as for BPH. For PAH in particular, you'll see Tadalafil branded as Adcerca. Now, why is the biohacking space nodding its head, not that head, towards PDE5 inhibitors? Part of this is because vasodilation and smooth muscle relaxation, improvement in unobstructed blood flow, could lend itself to other benefits if we're thinking exercise tolerance, stamina, endurance. So let's start off quickly for use of these meds as sort of sexual performance insurance, which people aren't foreign to that idea. There are companies like Blue Chew, for instance, that cater to the masses, treating these drugs more like a candy than a medicine, and it seems like it's possible PDE5 inhibitors may have a noticeable effect in people who use it from a sexual recreational or a sex creational standpoint, but it's unclear and inconsistent. It doesn't seem all too likely somebody will have significantly greater erection quality or sexual performance, but these meds seem to score better compared to placebo when it comes to subjective measurements of self-esteem and confidence and to perform. There also exists a small amount of data that suggests they may reduce the post-orgasmic refractory time, i.e. the time you're ready to roll again. I suppose this comes with the caveat that otherwise healthy men who turn to these meds may develop psychological reliance on them, which in the long term could actually affect performance. Risks versus benefits, I suppose. 
I know some people use these meds as a sort of hedge after drinking as well, which I suppose may serve them some benefit, as low doses of Viagra don't appear to potentiate or worsen the hypotensive effect of alcohol at a dose of 50 milligrams because that would be one of my greatest concerns. Now, before we get into the biohacking space, I want to give a quick shout out to everyone who's watched these videos and helped us get to almost 10k subs as a research-focused inherently dry science review channel, but if we could push that a little harder and hit that 10,000 subs mark, the shallow validity seeking muscle within me would tingle and I would greatly appreciate a like and subscribe from those of you who haven't already. I appreciate your time. So now let's get into the utility of these meds for your average gym bro. The research appears to be more mixed and dependent on context of use. For instance, there seems to be more of an effect of increased blood flow to contracted muscles in older adults when compared to younger ones. However, other research in younger adults who were university-level athletes didn't seem to show any significant changes to metrics of aerobic activity like VO2 max and exercise tolerance. But it did understandably lead to reductions in blood pressure. However, this research is over a decade old and begs the question, does baseline exercise capacity have an impact on results with these medications? Right, these were trained individuals. So would somebody with a less athletic lifestyle have a different or greater impact on these objective metrics? Does altitude play a role as well? Quite possibly. And it's worth noting that the rodent studies that showed benefit with regards to angiogenesis, so increased formation of blood vasculature. However, in these cases, the doses were much higher than those administered to humans, up to 15 to 20 times greater. And so if we were to push it to the same weight-based doses as were observed in rats, I would imagine that blood pressure would tank or alter significantly. On top of that, the same study that showed the angiogenic benefit noticed a dose-dependent atrophic response, as in, higher doses of sodenafil led to greater muscle atrophy, or muscle loss, through decreasing a gene called PGC1-alpha that protects against muscle loss while increasing proatrophic genes. So the research is more controversial than one may be led to believe, and there's not an abundance of recent human data analyzing these questions with regards to healthy individuals. However, researchers are nowadays continuing to evaluate these meds and rodents to assess these other metrics with some promising results regarding oxygen delivery to tissues during exercise. The primary goal here is to assess the extent to which sildenafil potentiates the nitric oxide pathway or modulates its actions through nitric oxide-induced vasodilation to better understand these effects before furthering research in humans. Moreover, the extent to which sildenafil may affect exercise capacity at higher altitudes is still a point of debate, as review of available data shows some benefit found with its use at higher altitudes, while others show no changes with regards to VO2 max or time trial performance under under hypoxic conditions. It's time we address the idea that PDE5 inhibitors can induce fat loss, and it's not a particularly foreign idea to the literature, however one that's been kind of evaluated. There's a study where patients who took either sildenafil or placebo showed reduced weight circumference in the PDE5 inhibitor group compared to placebo, and although there were no significant changes in BMI and HbA1c, there's an idea that the drug possibly has the ability to improve metabolic parameters by limiting inflammatory properties of adipose tissue itself. And rodent studies have shown a predominant effect in reduction of visceral adipose tissue compared to subcutaneous, which could indicate a preferential effect towards visceral fat in management of chronic metabolic conditions since the visceral fat directly surrounding our vital organs is more contributory to metabolic dysfunction and parameters of cardiovascular health than subcutaneous fat. And as such, a randomized clinical trial in humans that came out of Vanderbilt showed that in overweight pre-diabetic individuals, sildenafil improved insulin sensitivity but didn't affect glucose-stimulated insulin secretion, which means it has potential for improving metabolic parameters with a lower risk for hypoglycemia, or perhaps even does so via these changes in fat cell health and mitochondrial function within adipose tissue without further damaging the already overworked pancreas. In a nutshell, the idea here is that the drug can enhance features of insulin signaling in the health of adipose tissue itself, which would theoretically lead to an improved metabolic ecosystem. However, more robust human trials are needed to understand the extent and the mechanism, especially since, as we highlighted earlier, potential muscle loss with prolonged use is something to be aware of. I'll also add that, in the realm of cerebral small vessel disease in patients who suffered a non-embolic type of stroke, in a trial known as the OxHarp trial, 
Sildenafil did not appear to affect the pulsatility of the middle cerebral artery, which would indicate stronger blood flow, but it did improve cerebrovascular perfusion and reactivity, which would indicate greater oxygenation of the brain with use of sildenafil compared to placebo. Moreover, some animal studies have indicated that sildenafil can cross the blood-brain barrier and may be able to enhance features of neurogenesis and memory, perhaps through increased availability of cyclic GMP or CGMP, and this is another area that would benefit from larger, longer-term human data. Regarding side effects, some of the most common ones include headache, flushing, and indigestion. There do exist some cases of visual disturbances in about 3-11% to of sildenafil users, but the most severe of vision related conditions are less common, but they still do appear. For instance, while light sensitivity isn't particularly uncommon, blue-tinted vision or cyanopsia and non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, NAION, which we discussed with regards to semaglutide, most predominantly in patients who already suffer from metabolic dysfunction, are concerns to be aware of. Another concern is priapism or prolonged direction, oftentimes requiring surgical intervention. And since these videos are targeted through a more biohacking tinged lens, it's worth noting that a vasodilator medication in people who are lifting or performance endurance training may put them more at risk for orthostatic changes or sudden drops in blood pressure with certain maneuvers, which could lead to dizziness and in some cases even passing out. Ultimately, I was surprised to find that the medications have been clinically investigated in these more optimization-targeted clinical environments. However, the extent to which we know their mechanistic rules in these different patient populations at different altitude and different age groups in people with different comorbid medical conditions, they're lacking, understandably. I'm most particularly interested in the research on fat loss and improvement of adipose tissue function, so I'm curious to see where that data heads. And this whole realm of cognitive health and post-stroke recovery could be another angle that the research takes and quite fascinated to see those results as well. I do hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching. All the resources I looked at as usual will be cited in the description below. If you're looking for another way to support the channel, I do have a Patreon available where you can request videos and just join peptide-related conversation. I try to post all the newer research I read that I do find fascinating. And I'm happy to interact with the community as much as the community would like. On top of that, we do have a BPC-157 20-page educational guide available, as well as a newer retro-themed peptide catalog called the Peptide Codex, all of which will be linked in the description below. Most importantly, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy. He's your peptide buddy.